Wealth doesn't just happen. You have to go after it and build it. And the chase can be packed with thrills, frustration, and adventure. Join hosts Chris Sevigny and Jamie Bateman on a journey into mortgage notes, a little-known but fascinating type of real estate investing that's full of human drama and perfect for growing your IRA or savings. We build wealth by working with distressed borrowers who are fighting to keep their homes. And that's why we call it Good Deeds Note Investing. We're doing good and making money. Join us. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. I am your co-host, Jamie Bateman, flying solo as a co-host today. However, I'm joined by Mark Owens, a very special guest. Mark is from uh, Baltimore, Maryland, and he's done a a ton in uh, real estate that we're going to get into. And so I'm really excited to have you on the show today. Mark, how are you doing? Great. Thanks for the intro, Jamie. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Mark, why don't we start off with understanding for our audience uh, who you are, where you are today, what's your portfolio look like? We don't have to get into too many specifics of that mm-hmm. right off the bat, but just why should we listen to you? <laughs> well, everybody shouldn't listen to me. Depends on what your goals, it depends on what your goals are. If your goals are you want to work a 40-hour, 50-hour work week for somebody else for the rest of your life and make them rich and follow the poor dad philosophy, then don't listen to me because I'm the opposite of that. If you're looking for a way to develop some freedom, some wealth, some decent income while working a little bit, then maybe you should listen to me. I didn't start that overnight. It wasn't like an overnight success. It took years and years to get where I am today. But I just want to give you a, just a quick like high level overview. Yep. Absolutely. My thing. So 2001, I was in the IT business making decent money. 2002, I bought my first rental in the Hamden area of Baltimore City. 4011 Falls Road was the first <laughs> rental property that I bought. Over the next couple of years, I started to build, you know, buy more and more and more. In the beginning, I didn't know any other real estate investors. I mean, this is 2002. There was no meetup.com. There was no Facebook. I don't even think Google was around. I think I was still using Yahoo and web crawler. Yeah. It probably was brand new around right yeah. now. Yeah. And, and if it was, I didn't know about it. Yeah. I mean, you know, like there was no Facebook. Like Mark Zuckerberg was still poor. I think Rich Dad Poor Dad was still poor. You know? <laughs> like, Robert Kiyosaki was, was still yeah. poor. <laughs> yeah. Things were different. And I was just trying to figure it out. And I started wholesaling a few years into it. Made a bunch of money wholesaling, just kept buying rentals. After a few years in this business, in the real estate business, I was able to walk away from my IT job. And then uh, 10 years in real estate, I was able to just like do nothing, just live off my rental income. But I did more. I didn't just stop there. Like I just kept doing more because you kind of mm-hmm. get bored sitting around the house. Because <laughs> the truth yeah. is that you could be 45 years old making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year sitting on your ass doing nothing. Mm-hmm. And you're not going to be doing much because all your friends are still at work. That's and when true. they're not at work, they can't afford to go do anything anyway. You know, if you call <laughs> up your friends and say, hey, man, you want to go scuba diving in the Cayman Islands for two weeks? And they can't afford it. Sure. So it creates, you start to have different friends. It's hard to relate to the people that are still stuck in the rat race. And you're starting to meet other people that aren't, that found their way out. And so your friends start to change. Yeah. Just real quickly, I'm, I've experienced that myself, maybe not on the same same level or anything, but I went part-time at my work in 2015 and I actually just recently resigned. I haven't really said that on the podcast, but over the last few years, the same kind of thing where it's like, it's a, well, we'll get into mindset, I think, mm-hmm. but it's like the people I'm working with, they just... I have a lot of respect for my coworkers. It's not bashing mm-hmm. them, but it's just we're we're not speaking the same language anymore. And so I can relate to what you're saying. It's like it's it's just, we're just on different tracks. So mentally. So sure. anyway, sure. go ahead. Yeah, you know, I just I kept doing the real estate stuff and I discovered this burr thing that everybody's probably heard of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I figured that out around 2005. And I figured it out on my own. And I actually just did a video about that. I think it might've been last night, just about how the whole thing came about and how I kind of figured it out. And once I figured that out, then I was able to scale my business a lot faster, a lot larger with Mm -hmm. very little or nothing out of my pocket. And that changed things. Fast forward to today and beginning of this year, I had a little over a hundred rental units and I've sold two thirds of them the first six months of this year. And I wasn't intending to do it. 
I'm waiting for my wife. To, my wife is a nurse. She still works. Okay. She loves her job. Well, she loves it now. She used to hate it. I'll mm-hmm. get back to it. <laughs> so, okay. uh, I feel like there's a story I, there. <laughs> there is. And I've been trying to get her to, to just quit her job and buy an RV and just travel around the country for a few years. And we also, we own a, a condominium in the Cayman Islands. So I'd like to spend a lot more time there. COVID's kind of put a damper on that, but I get to go back in January. So anyway, so I've been trying to get her to quit her job so we can just travel around the country. And so a couple of years ago, I convinced her like, let's buy an RV and just get used to it and go spend some weekends in it and just get used to the whole thing. And then when we are ready to finally cut the cord, like we know mm-hmm. what we're doing, we're just ready sure. to go. So she finally agreed to that. And then I got a call at the beginning of this year from a real estate wholesaler. He actually sent me a text message asking if I knew anybody that had any 10 to 20 unit apartment complexes or apartment buildings for sale. And I've owned a few or did that were in that in that range. And I called him up and I just asked him like, man, what are you looking for? Who are your buyers? Mm-hmm. And he had some qualified New York buyers okay. that wanted to pay, in my opinion, top dollar. And I wasn't going to have to pay like the 6% real estate commission. So that alone saved me tens of thousands of dollars. And I ended up selling those guys an 18 unit building, a 14 unit building, a 13 unit building, a dozen garages. And then I sold another California buyer, a seven unit building and a three unit building. And this I was all and earlier I, this year, you said it was all this year. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so now I'm down to, I got a few dozen units left over and no debt, bunch of money in the bank, still trying to convince my wife, like, man, let's, <laughs> you know, Let's get out of here. You don't know what to do with yourself right now. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> it's like, I want to go, like, I don't want to wait till I'm like, you know, 70 years old and I, and mm-hmm. I need a walker to like go mm-hmm. to walk to the bottom of the Grand Canyon. You know, it's like, mm-hmm. I want to do it now. Like I'm still sure. pretty old. She started really considering, you know, like quitting her job. And then she finally, I, I've been trying to get her to look into this travel nursing thing for the last year and she had no interest in it. And then she started looking into it. Mm-hmm. And wouldn't you know, she said, <laughs> no, I think I'm going to do with a travel nurse. <laughs> and like two weeks later, she got a job. We're in, I'm from Baltimore mm-hmm. right now. I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. Okay. And she got a 13 week contract. I'm in my nice. camper nice. and we're at a campground. And so she's at work doing the nurse thing, which she enjoys. She loves it. So I encourage her to do that. If you like doing it, keep doing it. I wouldn't want to do it. I would be just going, I'd be like the nurse from hell, right? I'd, I wouldn't be in there like, man, I'd be like, just quit just, your freaking yeah, whining. You still got one leg. Yeah. <laughs> you know? like, yeah. I, 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 yeah. Be, I just said to my wife right about, it. I'm more of the uh, suck it up buttercup kind of thing with yeah, my daughter. And, right. You know, anyway, and, yeah, uh, I'd be like you. <laughs> so, you know, so she gets to do that. And then during the day, like I get, get the, go do whatever I want. And, uh, nice. which it was just stuff, you know, I'm saving the stuff she wants to do for the weekends and the evenings. Sure. And then during the week, Monday through Friday, when she's at work, I'm doing the things I want to do, like go hiking yeah. on different trails and maybe go to a museum. And no, I mean, that's fantastic. Like that. so, yeah. I mean, I, obviously our listener base is note investors, but I think a lot of, for the most part, people are after what you have right now. I mean, let's be honest, like time freedom, right? That's freedom. to me, that's, it's what it's all about, man. Yeah. So here's the deal. Like people have asked me over the years, like Mark, man, you got a hundred units. Why don't you like get another hundred? Why don't you get 200 or 300? Mm-hmm. Like, why are you stopping? Mm-hmm. And for me, and this is just personal. This is just the way I feel about it. It's not a right or wrong. It's just the way I mm-hmm. feel about it. Man, I got enough. Like, let's just say that you're going through a buffet and your plate's full of food, more food yeah. than you can eat. Are you going to go grab another plate and fill that one too? You've already got more food on the first plate than you can even eat. Sure. I'm there. I have enough. It's, <laughs> I can go buy a $300,000 car. It's not going to make me any happier than driving my Jeep. In fact, I'll probably feel kind of stupid for buying it <laughs> because the truth is the only people that care about your car are poor people. People that got money don't give a shit what you're driving. Uh, it's, yeah, that's, there's a lot and, of truth in that. Yeah. I mean, I see it all the time. I see, you know, a guy's 25 years old and he just made his first hundred thousand dollars and he runs out and buys a $80,000 car. Mm-hmm. You're not impressing anybody. You know, people <laughs> that got money, you think you're stupid. You know, it's like, that's just, you know, it's yeah. just, you know, you could have taken that $80,000 and bought a couple of rental properties and had your tenants buy your car. For me, it was like, I got enough money where I'm making enough money where I know that making more isn't going to make me that much happier. 
Yeah. And it could actually make me less happy because it increases my responsibility, the things that I have to do, the sure. things that I'm responsible for. And the stress that that creates offsets the extra money that you're making. Yeah. No, so I found sense. a balance that works for me. You know, and I'm just making numbers up. If I make $300,000 a year, that's a good balance for me. Some people might feel like they need to make 600 and that's right. okay. Some people might be happy making 50 and that's okay too. Whatever mm -hmm. your balance is, I found my balance. No, that's my balance great. isn't chasing more money. My balance is I found a way to do the things that I want to do when I want to do them. If I want to get out and spend 50 bucks on a steak lunch today by myself, I can do it. And that's enough yeah. for me. So that's what I was looking for was the freedom. The money was at first when I first started, mm -hmm. we're all looking for money at first. Yeah. And then yeah. after you start to get it, after you start making a hundred thousand a year, 200,000 a year, you start to realize, all right, well, I'm working my ass off. I'm not much happier than I was when I was making 20% less than I'm making now. So why mm -hmm. should I keep chasing the money? Like, what is it that I really want to do with my life? Mm -hmm. What do I yeah. really want to do? And then how can I make it so that I can do that more and work less? Note investing is an exciting space, but when you think of servicing your loans, you may automatically feel a sense of overwhelm and frustration. BiFi Loan Servicing is here to change that. BiFi is a servicing company founded by investors for investors and managed by servicing veteran Shante Duffy. To learn more, visit BiFiLS.com. Again, that's B I F I L S.com. Money is a critical piece to to sure. where you are. Like it's not yeah. an unimportant thing, right? I mean, there is very important, but only to a point. It shouldn't be the end goal. I mean, so, and yeah, and I think that's one of the big struggles people have is understand. I mean, you seem content, very content, but still hungry for an active lifestyle and you seem happy and content, but you're not lazy. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah, like, yeah. It, it's, it's you know, really like, I think of a lot of like analogies, some, some people mm -hmm. get pissed off by them. Sorry, it just helps me <laughs> my own brain to explain things. But to look at it like I'm going to say something that might be offensive to some people, and if this offends you, then I'm sorry. But I used to, to be real one of, on the show. Yeah, I used to be one of these guys. I was a little fat, and if fat people are offended by that, sorry. <laughs> I was I was a little fat, a little chunky, and I decided I want to start losing weight. Now I was at. 225 at my highest weight. That mm -hmm. might not sound like a lot, but I'm not a tall guy. I'm like five foot six, something like that. Every year I shrink a little bit. I think I'm five <laughs> foot six today. <laughs> and uh, yeah, getting old sucks, man. You get shorter, your ears keep getting bigger, and you, you lose hair where you want it and you start growing it where you don't. Like it's yeah. fucking up. Yeah. But it's better than the alternative. Yep. So, this is true. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, See, I lost complete track of what no, I was talking. So you were losing weight. You decided to lose weight. Yeah. So how much do you want to lose? I mean, do right. you want to weigh 70 pounds <laughs> right. and be anorexic and die? Sure. You know, I mean, it's like you got to find a weight that works for you that you feel comfortable with. I've, right, right now, I'm 190 pounds, yeah. lost 35 pounds, and I'm good nice. with that. I wouldn't mind yeah. losing another five or 10, sure. but I feel sure. a hell of a lot better than I did when I weighed 225. I can tie my shoes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm laughing because it's, I, yeah, I get it. So it's the same with money. It's like, how much weight do you want to lose? How much money do you need to make? And it's sure. like, you're not going to lose all your weight. You're going to disappear into nothing. Do you want to make a, a billion dollars a year and then have no free time at all? Right. Where you're a slave to your job and making the money and you don't have time to spend with your family, and your, your yeah. children and your spouse. No, it makes sense. And I think a lot of us get wrapped up in, we pick a an investing strategy and we get wrapped up in, the how to, which is important. Sure. You're, obviously, you know how to to burr. You know how to buy properties. You know, you, there's a lot that we're not going to get into on this episode that you know how to do. But it's like it's very easy to get caught up in that and forget about the mindset or the end goal. Where are you headed? What do you do when you get there? So, let's dive into your background a little more. So, you're, you're obviously you're at a point where. Do you have people who work for you currently, or do you just run the show yourself, or how does that work? Uh, I've, I've always self-managed my, my properties. Mm -hmm. like I've got people that I don't pay them every day, but when I need them, I pay them. Like, you know, got my it. HVAC guy, my carpet guy, my lead inspector, you know. And I'm, all your properties are in Baltimore? Is that? That is correct. Yep. Okay. All my investment properties are in Baltimore. Sure. Got it. Okay. So you're kind of running the show, but, but you're not working a ton of hours. <laughs> I was talking to a friend this morning about it, maybe three hours a week. 
on my rental business. That's great. And um, it's not, I get a few dozen units free and clear. I don't have any notes or anything. It's just, and right. everything's on auto pay. It's one of the things that I've done to yeah. just make my life easy. It's like just about every single thing I have is on sure. auto pay. And I know you do some mentoring. We can get into that, but I mean, mm-hmm. so that's where you are now. Let's rewind. I know you went back to 2001, 2002 already, mm-hmm. but let's go a little further back if you don't mind and, and uh, dive into your kind of more of your story. This is something that I just recently started coming out about. And what I'm going to talk about is stuff that has been embarrassing for me and for most of my life and stuff that I've tried to hide a part of my past that I tried to hide from people because I didn't want to be judged on the person that I was in the 1980s, like 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. So when I was, uh, when I was a kid, you know, I got kicked out of high school. I was like, I was a drug addict and I got kicked out of high school my senior year. When I was 17 years old, I started shooting Coke and heroin and I was a junkie. I was a 17 year old junkie. And by the time I was uh, my early twenties, I was at that time I was robbing drug dealers. That was like my main, like if I'm going to rob somebody, I'm robbing a drug dealer. Mm. You know, I tried stealing and stuff like that. And stealing kind of sucked because you go steal something, then you got to find somebody to buy it. And they're not going to give you what you think it's worth. And so it's just easier just get to rob the drug dealer and get the drugs directly and their money if they got any. So I started doing that. And then that whole lifestyle kind of came to a screeching halt in 1989. I robbed, I robbed the bank in Philadelphia and I robbed couple of dozen stores in the Baltimore City, Baltimore County, Hartford County, Carroll County area. And I got locked up September 8th of 1989 in Baltimore City on Monument Street in a stolen car and ran a red light in a stolen car at one o'clock in the morning. I mean, that's kind of stupid, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I just ran out of the store at a hotel, motel room on Pulaski Highway I was staying in, robbed the store, went and bought some drugs, got a girl with me, a friend who I'm still friends with. And we're on our way back to this motel to get high. And I just couldn't wait to get high because, you know, junkies, we had this need for immediate gratification, which is definitely your enemy for succeeding in anything in life. So I ended up getting locked up. And up until that point, like the truth is like, I had tried to get out of this lifestyle. I'd been to drug rehabs, not only in Maryland, but in Pennsylvania, Virginia, and California. And I got kicked out or walked out of half of them. I had been locked up in Maryland, Pennsylvania, I did 60 days in Florida for a strong arm robbery, which was dropped to theft. I tried different girlfriends, different religions, AA, NA. Like I tried everything I could think of and like nothing was working. So now I'm in, I'm in jail and I'm, I got armed robberies in Baltimore city, Baltimore County, Harford County, Carroll County, got the bank in Philly. And I got another street robbery in Pennsylvania. And I'm thinking I'm gonna get a jail for like, you know, a hundred years. And I wasn't done. I'm like, when I, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to try to escape from prison, like whatever, like you're going to have to shoot me off the fence. Like I'm not done. And I'm not, I'm not going to, like, I always thought that I was just going to either OD or get shot. Like I wasn't expecting to spend years in jail and I wasn't going to do it. It's like, you're going to have to shoot me off the fence. Cause I'm, you know, it's like, you know, that was my mentality at the time. Nothing to lose. Right. No, I had nothing to lose. I attempted to escape out of Baltimore County Detention Center on October 2nd of 1989. Was this close to getting out of their escape proof jail. I got the thing off my window and the grate. And I was actually, there was a, the only thing between me and the street was a piece of plastic about a half inch thick. And I had a four foot piece of steel that I broke off a bunk bed that I was using to pry that out. And fortunately, one of the guards outside saw it and heard the noise and and called us. Wow. So I get on, I, so I ended up, they run up in my cell and they, you know, cuff me and take me to lock up where you're locked in a cell by yourself for 23 hours a day. I got a six month sentence on lock up, which like, I didn't even care. It's like, I'm already locked up. So now I get a private cell. My attorney came in and here's the point. My attorney comes to see me. Now I'm going to use some language here that might be offensive to some people, but I'm mm-hmm. just giving you a heads up. So I walk in the room, I sit down and this, you know, the steel table and he comes in and he sits across from me and he looks at me and he says, what the fuck is wrong with you? You're already in jail. Can't you even stay out of trouble in jail? Like, don't mm-hmm. you realize mm-hmm. that if you do what you're supposed to do, you can be home by the time you're 30 years old, you'll be young enough to start a whole new life. Mm-hmm. And he looked at me and he said that, and I felt stupid. <laughs> I, mean, like, I was like, I felt like really dumb. 
but he gave me some hope. Like I could start mm-hmm. a whole life. And that was never part mm-hmm. of my equation. Like I never even considered that because mm-hmm. I had tried AA and NA and all this other shit and nothing. Mm-hmm. And so over the course, of like the next day, hmm. things changed in my brain. I was like, "Interesting." I don't have to get shot off the fence. Hmm. I don't have to get to prison. In fact, I can consider prison rehab. I'm hmm. not going to prison. I'm going to rehab. This is going to give me an opportunity to work on myself and figure something out so that maybe I can be home by the time I'm 30. So your whole perspective changed or it, starting yeah, to change. I had, he gave me hope when I didn't have any hope. It's funny because now that I'm coming out with this story that mm-hmm. I didn't I hid for so many years, I actually called him up. He's still alive mm-hmm. and he's still mm-hmm. a lawyer. I found him in the phone book and mm-hmm. not the phone book. I Googled his name <laughs> and I found out he's yeah. still an attorney in Harford County. And I, I called him up and his, this was just like a month and a half, two months ago. And then the lady answers the phone and she says, well, is he expecting your call? And I said, <laughs> Probably not. I was, you know, I was his client, like you know, like thirty years. And You've been she, waiting by the well, phone for his call for three decades. <laughs> she, she put me on hold. He got on the phone, and I said, "Hey, look, man, my name is Mark Owens. You were my client. I just wanted to let you know that you said something that wow. made a huge difference in my life. You told you asked, and I just relayed the story that I just said, and that's what mm-hmm. you said to me. I said you gave me hope, like a different direction that I hadn't even considered. As a result of that, today." I've been married to my high school sweetheart for 25 years, have an amazing Mm -hmm. son that just graduated from Alabama and has a job working as a first year analyst for an investment bank in Charlotte. I got an amazing business. I'm respected member of community. I'm healthy. And like, I have a really, really, to me, Mm -hmm. amazing life. And Mm -hmm. I define amazing life. Everybody can have an amazing life. When you live a life where you exceed your own expectations, (laughs) that's an amazing life. It's not a comparison. It's like, I'm yeah. not comparing myself to, you know, Robert Kiyosaki or Grant yeah. Cardone. I'm looking at right. where I was at 30 years ago. And to me, that's an amazing thing. And you, everybody uh, can do the same yeah. thing. All yeah. So I, just, uh, so I wanted to tell him to let him yeah. know, like, and like you, you made a difference. You made yeah. a difference in my life. So what, and, did, what did he say? He was blown away by it. I mean, mm-hmm. he actually, I didn't know it at the time, but he had me on speaker. So his whole huh. audience, his whole huh. office like, heard the conversation. Okay. You know, I'm sure... I can see him getting at home and sitting down at, at dinner with his wife that night and say, and hear him say like, guess what happened to me today at work? <laughs> <laughs> That's not a normal Wednesday or whatever. I want to backtrack a little bit because this is something mm-hmm. else that happened after maybe 10 years ago, 12 years ago, I looked up the cop that locked me up. The one that caught me in the stolen car. I, I looked him mm-hmm. up on Facebook and I found him. <laughs> I sent him a Facebook message like, hey, you used to be a cop in Eastern District, the Baltimore City. And he didn't respond. Right. And I, mean, I don't blame him. He probably yeah, went like cleaning his gun. And, yeah. Right, <laughs> and right. Who is this guy? And yeah. Like two weeks later, I sent him, well, he knows who I am. He got a commendation. Gotcha. When he locked me up. I mean, it was like the, okay. the rest wow, of his okay. career. FBI was looking for me. He saw the couple dozen robberies. It was a big deal for him. I sent him another message. I said, look, man, he locked me up September 1989. And I just want you to know that you saved my life. And I want you to know that I'm really sorry for all the stuff that I did. I regret all of it. And you saved my life. And today I have a really amazing life. And it wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you. And I just want to, wow. I still get emotional talking about it. And then he messaged me back. And that today we're friends. I mean, I got his phone number on my phone. You know, it's like we talked on the phone maybe four months ago. So my point for that is it's like, man, it's like, it's never too late to go back in your past. You know, if you did something to somebody, you know, 20 years ago that was wrong and you know it was wrong and it's like it affecting you, man, you should call those people or send them an email or text message and just say, listen, man, I just want you to know, I'm really sorry. I don't expect anything from you, mm-hmm. but I just want you to know that I regret what I did. And it's also never too late to call somebody up and thank them for something that they did. Somebody said something that maybe it was a teacher or a coach or a neighbor or an uncle. Yeah. Somebody says something and years later you look back and you realize like that made a significant difference in your life, mm-hmm. man, you should call them and let them know. Yeah. And, I mean, uh, this is make just, you feel good. Yeah. Well, yeah. I and mean, that, that too, there's, I guess 
blessings in it for yourself yeah. as well. But uh, so, yeah. So let me fast forward a little yeah. bit. So yeah. I'm in jail. I get off a lockup. And, and while I'm on lockup, I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to figure this shit out. I'm going to get my life together. I don't know what I'm going to do, I'm gonna, but I'm going to have to do something different. And so I get off lockup and I find a book on the tier, the pod, whatever they, uh, they call them pods in Baltimore County Detention mm. Center. So I find a book on top of one of the tables and I picked it up and it was called, you can, if you think you can. And I looked at the back and the author's name was Norman Vincent Peale. And I know this now he was, his more famous book was called the power of positive thinking. Mm. I'm reading this book and it's like, take control of your life, become the person you want. And I'm just like, yeah, man, it's right up my alley. I'll read this. I got plenty of time, right? <laughs> it's like, I'm in jail, you know? <laughs> Nothing but time. I started reading that book. And halfway through it, the author, he convinced me that I could take control of my life and be the person I've always wanted to be if I believe that I can do it. And he convinced me. And halfway through the book, I smoked cigarettes at the time. You could smoke in jail back then. I'm like, man, you know what? I'm going to take control of my life and I'm going to start right now. Fuck these cigarettes. <laughs> and I quit smoking. It was in the middle of the day at a half pack. And I had this guy, Frank Bertano, which was one of my jailhouse bodies. I was like, Frank, take these cigarettes. Fuck these. I'm done. <laughs> after. And it was for me to prove to myself that I'm not mm-hmm. playing. Like I'm taking control of my shit. I'm going to, yeah. I'm the captain of this ship. I'm right. steering the damn boat. And that book changed everything. Once, once I believed in myself, it changed yeah. everything in my life. And, and so there was three things that happened. First, the hard stop cop locks me up. Mm-hmm. Second thing, the attorney mm-hmm. gives me plants a seed where I did of hope. It wasn't a 180 because a 180 means you're going back to where you came from. I didn't want to get back there. But <laughs> right, so it right. was like, it was like a course correction of maybe like 20 degrees or something, you okay. know, yeah. where it's like, took me somewhere where I was never expecting you guys. So the, so the cop stopped me. Yeah. The attorney gave me a new sense of direction. Yep. And then the book gave me the fuel to get there because hmm. I believed in myself. And for guys, like I can, you know, it's like we can all relate to this. Like if you're hopefully this never happens to you, but say you're in a Home Depot parking lot and you get into some kind of altercation with somebody and you know, like, all right, we're going to start swinging. Like <laughs> this is we're going to we're going to be fighting. If they got two ways to look at it, you can look at it like, oh man, this guy's going to kick my ass. I hope he doesn't punch me in the face. I hope it doesn't hurt. <laughs> you already lost, man. Like you're, yeah. you're already done. Sure. And you can, and you can start walking towards the guy thinking I'm going to almost set something bad. <laughs> I'm going to tear this guy's face off. Like his kids aren't even going to know who he is when I'm done with him. <laughs> and you still might get your butt kicked. Right. But the chances of winning are significantly yeah. greater when you believe in yourself. Sure. And so, and I can tell you, there were times in my previous life Mm -hmm. where I got into altercations with people. Now I'm not a big guy and I'm not a tough guy, but I would get it. I got in altercations with guys that were significantly bigger and had a significantly greater potential of violence than me. Mm -hmm. And I punked them down. Like I, I would physically, you you should have physically, you should have lost, but mentally but if they see in my eyes, like, man, like, like, (laughs) like we're like this, I don't care what you do. I'm coming back and they can (laughs) sense that. And like, they walk away and you can do anything in your life like that. You can hmm. say, I'm going to take down that apartment building. I'm going to get a hundred units. So what? I have nothing. I come from nothing. I grew up in a poor family with a poor man mentality. So what? I'm going to get a hundred units. And there's nothing stopping you. When you believe in yourself, there's nothing stopping you from that. No, I think that, I mean, this message is phenomenal, for, especially for the, just what the country has been through in the last couple of years and varies based on your personal situation and which, you know, which state you're in and all kinds of, some people have had it great. Other people have had a really rough. Starts on the inside, man. But yeah, I mean, it's, and it's all about perspective. Okay. I I ruptured my Achilles this past year. That was challenging. I car broke down. Like for me personally, I'm just like, okay, I don't even want to talk about any of those things. I'm bringing it up because it's almost embarrassing because Mm -hmm. compared to what you've been through, it's a joke. And it's like, (laughs) I mean, and again, you're not into the comparison thing, but it just, it makes me realize like, if I can't, I mean, come on, like get my perspective. Right. So I'm going to tell you, I'm going to share the way that I see that. Cause I've had the same problems you have, you know, car issues, whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's almost sounds kind of depressing, but it helps to put things into perspective for me. If something bad happens to me today, I get in a car accident. My wife gets in a car accident, whatever. Tenant trashes my house or one of my houses, like whatever. It's very easy to get upset with that. But I realized that, man, if I just make it home tonight, I'm already home, but you know, if my right. wife makes it home and we go to bed tonight, 
like we're all still alive and breathing and our son's good and our dog's good. Like, man, it's a good day. Like, no, that other shit <laughs> matters, man. Yeah. Like if I can just make it home to the end of the day yeah, and, and give my wife a kiss goodnight, like it's a good day. None of that other shit matters. And that's the way I see it. And I even take it a step further where, and I'm sure you've had this happen. You wake up three o'clock in the morning and you can't fall yeah. back asleep and you start getting mm-hmm. pissed off. You can't fall back asleep. <laughs> and then, you know, and then it makes it even more hard to fall back asleep. And one day I realized, you know what, like one day I'm not even going to wake up at all. Yeah. And so when I wake up at three o'clock in the morning and I hear my wife next to me snoring a little bit, <laughs> and, you know, yeah. and you know, see the dog in the other room. I'm like, man, I'm just glad I woke up because one, because one day I won't. And I'm just glad I did. And everybody that I love that I can see is here and they're doing well. Yeah. And then I usually fall right back asleep. It's just yeah. changing your perspective. Right. One of the things that happen can make did, so much of a difference in our lives. I saw a clip recently. It was a couple of weeks ago from some interview, but it was, if I gave you a million dollars, would you be happy? People are like, yeah, of course. Like if I gave you 10 million, would you be happy? You know, of course I would, you know, but then it's like, well, the one caveat is you can't wake up. You don't wake up to receive it. So it basically it puts a number on when you wake up in the morning, why don't you feel like you just received $10 million? You should, because you're saying that that is more important right now. You're saying that is more important than receiving $10 million. If you're, yep. if you're dead, well, then every day you should wake up and cherish <laughs> I, that, you know, more I than agree, $10 million. Man. I agree. Um, I, I've asked people that in the, it just in the past couple of months, like if, if I ask you, do you want a million dollars? You're going to say, sure. And I say, okay, what, well, but the caveat is you're going to die two days from now. Do you still want right, a million right, dollars? Right, well, no, exactly. Want it. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, so, we might be dead in two days anyway, you right. know, but your time is more valuable than the money is. Yeah. How did you get into the, you went into the IT world, right? How did you yeah, that was no easy trick, man. After I got out of prison in 94, I went to, this is going to probably blow some people away, but I went to the University of Maryland in Baltimore County. I actually went to college for a couple of years in Hagerstown in prison. Got my two-year degree mm-hmm. in business administration. Nice. Then I got out. I went to UMBC and majored in biochemistry. And I got a job working as a lab technician. And like, this is a poor dad moment right here. So I'm working as a lab technician mm-hmm. and the boss comes in and we could tell like, you know, there's like 30 people that work there and, you know, they get the rumor mill and all that crap, mm-hmm. you know, he said, she mm-hmm. said the high school shit for adults and uh, <laughs> everybody's talking about, you know, there's gonna be layoffs, going to close down the businesses and go, well, one day the, the boss walks in the lab and says, all right, everybody in the break room. And I'm thinking like, oh, here he goes. So we go in a break room and he says, listen, everybody, I know about the rumors. I know what he's thinking, but we're not going anywhere. We're going to ride this out together. Things are going to get better. Everybody's good. And then Friday, he laid off a third of us. And I was in the third and I'm like, man, you just told like that's <laughs> when people get shot. Like, I mean, right. it's like, you know, I mean, I went out and bought a house that night or, right, you know, right, like, right, right. Yeah. You know? So you tell me my job's good. And then two days later, you lay me off. And, and like, that's crazy. Yeah. And I was just thinking like, man, this is stupid. And, I'm, and then I get a job working at WR Grace as a consultant, as a okay. lab technician. Okay. And like two weeks before Christmas, they laid off 130 people, including all the temps, except for me. I was the only one. I'm watching guys that have been there 25 years, put their stuff in a box and walk out the door. And I'm still standing there like watching them. And as all this is going on, I'm looking through the newspaper. There, there used to be, a well, it's still around the Sun paper, but the Sun mm-hmm. paper was before there was like, you know, Craigslist and all the newspapers mm-hmm. where you went to look for a job. Classified. Yeah. Classified. Yeah. Yep. And uh, I started looking, you know, for the lab jobs and there's like two or three lab jobs and there's like six pages of computer jobs. And I'm looking at the six pages of computer jobs and I'm like one year experience, $90,000 a year. And I'm like, what? Like these people aren't <laughs> even that smart. Like, I mean, I know them, they, you know, they work here. They're not that bright, you know, it's like they're not any smarter than I am. So I had switched years and started okay. doing IT stuff. And a friend told me, he says, man, don't waste your time getting a degree in computer science. They won't even teach you how to hook up a printer. He said, get a Microsoft system, certified systems engineer certification. That'll open the doors for you. So I started taking those classes and then I got a job working with a help desk at like Mason. Okay. And then six months later, I got, I lost that job. My boss calls me up and she calls me into her office. Now I'm a temp at the time. And she says, Mark, mm-hmm. I'm pleased to announce that like Mason would all, like to offer you a permanent position. And I said, well, Myrna, I said, there's something I got to tell you. I got some selling. Got a background. Yeah. 
So, yeah. and, and so she said, all right, well, that shouldn't be a problem. Hold on. So she gets on the phone. She's talking to HR. And I could see like, like her eyes kind of filling up a little bit. Hmm. And then she hung up and she looked at me and she said, Mark, I am so hmm. sorry. And like within 15 seconds, two guys pop in the door behind me. They're like, Mr. Owens, you got to go. <laughs> and he wow. scored me to my desk and fill up, you know, like I didn't have anything there, a couple pens, you know, whatever. And then they take me to the elevator down 25 flights. And then they walk me out to the sidewalk. And then they're like, see you. <laughs> and I'm looking up. 25 stories at my office window overlooking the beautiful downtown inner Harbor mm -hmm. half hour ago. I had a great job. And now wow. I'm like in the street with nothing. My, my, uh, my brother actually got laid off by from Lake Mason. It was a wake up. I deserved it. <laughs> like, I mean, I wasn't a victim. Like I mm. did a lot of bad things and I'm paying mm. the price. You know, that's like, that's just part of the game. I played mm. the game. I lost. And so I wasn't upset about it. I was just like, mm -hmm. one door closes, another one's going to open. And I found mm -hmm. another job, a better job, a week later, paying more money, learning more stuff. And then, you know, within a few years, I was actually teaching these Microsoft certified systems mm -hmm. engineer classes at colleges all over the United States or mm -hmm. all over Maryland for a company mm -hmm. that taught all over the United States. And I was teaching all over Maryland, some in Pennsylvania. And I was also started teaching like, this is going to sound really funny, but I was, I taught like internet security at the NSA at Fort Meade. <laughs> I mean, they're like the ones that like invent all the shit mm -hmm. to like, you know, hack mm -hmm. into stuff. <laughs> and I'm teaching them internet <laughs> security. Top secret clearances and they, yeah. they have to get background checks. Galore. And they didn't check me. And I was in the server room at Fort Meade, like playing on the servers and they'd never done <laughs> background checks on me, that which is, doesn't make any sense. I should probably just say that's where I technically work still. <laughs> See, um, yeah, I was there. <laughs> that's crazy. So on the background, not, not for Department of Defense or anything like that, mm -hmm. but was it like, because you had a time gap between the criminal history and the future companies just not run background checks they on you? They didn't or? run background checks. There was such okay. a demand for people doing it that yeah. they didn't run. And, and like, it might not sound like a lot of money today, but I was making, a, I was getting paid a hundred dollars an hour to teach these classes. And, and this in is the in year the, 2000, the, okay. it was around the year 2000, a hundred dollars an hour was a little bit more in 2000 than it is in 2022 sure. or 2021. Yeah. And this is my mindset. I'm not mm -hmm. saying this works for everybody, but this worked for me. But I started making really good money, 130 to 150 a year. And I was 10 years earlier, I was like sleeping in abandoned houses in California and Florida and sleeping under a bridge and eating Christmas dinner in a freaking homeless shelter. And now I'm making all this money. And you would think that I would take that and go run out and spend it on stuff. Well, I had the mm -hmm. opposite. I'm like, man, I'm saving this because I don't mm -hmm. know how long it's going to last. And I know what mm -hmm. it's like to be like a thousand Without miles from it. nothing to mm -hmm. eat and know where to go. And I don't ever want to feel like that again. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I saved my money. And, and I just want to kind of like, I know we're going to run out of time, but I just want to kind of just do a quick thing here. So yeah. I, saved, I saved a bunch of money. And with the money that I saved, I had to invest it in something. And that's when I started buying rental properties. And some of the keys, and I just want to give some, yeah, some absolutely. of my own, like, I guess it's advice. Mm -hmm. But uh, if there's nothing new that I'm going to tell you, but stuff that worked for me, like live below your means. My wife and I still own the townhouse that we bought in 1990. I think it was 1996. We still own mm -hmm. it. And in fact, we were living in it a month ago. If my income went up 50%, my standard of living went up 10%. I didn't raise my standard of living to match my income. And I mm -hmm. took that extra money and I invested it in other cash flowing assets. You mm -hmm. could do it. You could buy notes. You could buy rental properties. Mm -hmm. You could buy yeah. you know, some other type of business that preferably has more of a passive type income to it. And that's what I started doing. And by living like that, by realizing that having an expensive car, a $900,000 house, isn't going to make me any happier mm -hmm. than my own house. Mm -hmm. Once you, yeah. if you're able to realize that and admit that to yourself and say, it's mm -hmm. not about trying to impress other people, it's about what's good for me in my long term. Sure. And the chances of having the type of freedom that I have are significantly Greater. greater. Yeah, and no, that's great. And all the money that you make. We, I see these, I these, see these like wars on Twitter and other places where it's like cutting expenses versus increasing your income, you know, which one is more effective. And obviously if you don't increase your income and you only cut your expenses, that only goes so far, right. you know, you got to do both. <laughs> you got to do both. It's like, why is this an either or? I don't understand why we're arguing right. over this. Yeah. Do both. Yeah, man. You can do both. <laughs> and if your income goes up, that doesn't mean you're 
if I start making another fifty thousand dollars this year, I'm not going to like increase my cable TV channels another hundred and fifty channels. Why am I going to spend that money? I'm not watching the hundred channels I already have. Yeah, but some right. people just feel like they have to spend that money, and it's mm-hmm. just like, man, I you know I'll take that same money. Here's an example. This is what I ask people, and this is how you can tell where somebody's going to go in their mm-hmm. future based on the on the way that they answer this question. And of course, it's always subject to change as they get more information. But the question is. Sure. If I gave you a million dollars, what would you do with it? And you're going to hear people say, man, I'm going to get a new Tesla and I'm going to get a bigger house. And I'm going to go on vacation and I'm going to get mm-hmm. my teeth fixed and I'm going to do this and that. And they talk about what they're going to spend, what <laughs> right. they're going to buy. Sure. And if somebody gave me a million dollars and they said, what are you going to mm-hmm. spend it on? I'd say, oh, man, I'm going to get buy eight houses in Bel Air Edison <laughs> and I'm going to own all eight of them free and clear. And after all of my expenses and everything else, I'm going to make $5,000 a month. And then I'm going to take that $5,000 a month and I'm going to get by that car you're talking about and that watch you're talking about. And, that <laughs> right. you're talking about, right. and I'm still going to have eight houses. <laughs> and I'm going to be getting that $5,000 a month every month for the rest of my life. And then when I'm dead, my kid gets it. Same no, amount of money. Right. Different perspective. You know, how, what are you going to do with it? And that's where most people get lost. Here's what it is is it's that need for immediate gratification. I mm-hmm. want it now. Well, that's yeah. the enemy of success, man. That's the enemy of your long-term prosperity. When you mm-hmm. want it right now and you can't wait, you're, you're setting yourself up. You're your own worst enemy. So in the beginning of your, in the 2002 timeframe, were you, you were putting any profits and cash flow back into the business? Is that? Yeah, I did that for years. The, uh-huh. Even when I started wholesaling and I was making hundreds of thousands a year wholesaling, stayed in my house. And I started to realize that I'm more interested in experiences. I wanted to pay for my son's school. My son went to Boys Latin, mm-hmm. private school, yeah. pretty expensive. I think yeah. his senior year was like twenty eight, twenty nine thousand dollars $29,000. Yeah. My, my sister's teaching there now. Yeah. I wanted to pay <laughs> for that. And so I wanted my son to go there. And then when he graduated from high school, he went to school at Alabama. We had to pay out-of-state tuition and you know he joined a fraternity and we had, you know, so we paid for everything. It was about 60000 a year. We've paid for his school. We were done paying for everything before he even graduated. And we mm-hmm. did that cash. We didn't get any loans or anything like that. Mm-hmm. By keeping our standards of living mm-hmm. below what it, we needed to, we were able mm-hmm. to do things like that. And mm-hmm. then we were also able to, we bought a, we own a condominium on the beach mm-hmm. in the Cayman Islands that we own free and clear. Yeah, that's, that's great. That's and it's awesome. Great. So I'm looking for like, <laughs> those are experiences for me. Like that's my kind of like my happy place. Mm-hmm. And it's like, it's not something like your people are going to drive by and say, Oh, look at Mark's condo. It's like very few people even know I have it. You know, it's just, it's for me. It's not to impress anybody. It's just something that I wanted that I got. It took years to get there. And yeah. a lot of people just don't have the patience. Well, that's it. the, yeah, that's the thing that's, it's very easy on a podcast to blow past the fact that this, this took many, many years. Yeah. You know, a lot it of wasn't it, it wasn't success, man. Yeah. yeah. And even your mindset shift, you listed three very clear you know, moments, but those were over likely over years. Right. And so it wasn't, I'm not downplaying any one of those things, but it wasn't just a two second thing. And oh, now Mark is a changed man, a hundred percent. And it's like, well, no, it actually was a a process. I wouldn't recommend anybody go through the process. I went through. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, wouldn't recommend it. Um, No, but I mean, I think, but I think people can learn from you. (laughs) Easiest things to take away from this. That's a no brainer. That's the hope, man. I mean, it's like, when I do coaching and stuff like that, mm-hmm. like I can't make anybody successful. I'm like a personal coach for, you know, mm-hmm. working out and stuff like that. Like I can tell you what to do, but if you don't do it, it's not my yeah. fault. And when I get clients for my coaching, I don't like, I'm not a motivational coach. Mm-hmm. Like don't pay me and then expect me to motivate you to go do something. Like, sure. Like, if you want that, go see Tony Robbins. I'm not going to motivate <laughs> you. After you see Tony Robbins, then come Don't see me. See me. <laughs> so, uh, the only thing that I can do and, and that we can do in this time that we have together in these podcasts is we can shorten people's learning curves. Yeah. Absolutely. It doesn't take you 10 years to learn it. You can learn it in a week. Sure. Listen to somebody else that's already done it. Right. Listen to what Jamie's done in the note buying arena. I don't know yeah. a damn thing about notes, but if I, wanted to, <laughs> if, I, yeah. if I wanted to learn how to do it, I got, there's two choices. One is I can kind of maybe try to figure it out. Right. And then like, well, I don't even know where to buy them. And then if I do buy them, like, well, how much should I pay for them? And then what if they don't pay me, then what am I supposed to do? Yeah. Yeah. Am I supposed to discount them? Because people that are selling them, it's, I mean, I don't know. Well, I I I I just, I I can see you. I can listen to you and say, Jamie, you're in a note buying thing. How do I do this? And I can shorten that learning curve. And and the shorter learning curve is the more money you make. No. And that's what, that's what I've 
done as well. It's like, well, that's exactly what I, not that I'm the all time guru or, or model for notes by myself, but I, I had the same approach that you're just talking about. It's like, well, I, I can figure this out. I mean, meaning other people have done this first. Why am I reinventing the wheel? I can just take bits and pieces of information from this guy and this, this gal and, you know, and, and put them together and figure out what, what works. And it's really more about taking ownership of your situation, taking responsibility for your future and focusing on kind of action and progress and solutions versus problems, which are real problems are very real. You've had a ton of problems in in your life. Mm -hmm. I mean, but it's a mindset perspective shift. If you would be up for it, I think we need to bring you back on at some point. If if I can spend an hour this morning and say something that's going to make a positive impact on somebody's life, it's well worth my time. Yeah. I mean, there are so many rabbit holes I'd love to go down right now, but we we are out of time. And I know you've well, you're maybe not as busy as you used to be, but <laughs> I guess you've got and this time, I, you know what? time I, freedom. I have some coaching clients. I'm not looking for more, just telling you. Like, I'm not trying to promote myself, but I have a call yeah. today, 1230. And I don't think I have anything else on my schedule till Monday morning. I'm talking to another one of my coaching clients Monday. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it's that's, pretty good, that's... man. I'm content. You're not pushing anything on anybody or anything like that, but where can people reach out to you or find more about you? The best place is probably, I have a Facebook group. It's called uh-huh. Mark Owens REI. There's a page in a group. The page okay. is just like a placeholder. So it's like yep. a waste of time joining that. Join the group. There's a bunch of videos on there. Put stuff on just, and I'm not like trying to sell anything. It's just like stuff that I put out there in hopes that somebody will get something out of it, something useful out of it. So that's probably the best place to find me. My okay. email address is, it's Mark at, markowens.com. So if you need to hit me up for something, you got a quick question or something, that's probably the best way to just get in touch with me directly. Yeah. So I'm sure you have a big network in in the Baltimore area and for real estate specifically. But to me, it's just like, that's important, you know, if somebody, but it's really what I'm gathering from this, this whole episode is just mindset and perspective and just so much more important. It is everything. And I'll tell you something else, this, like the Maryland Investors Network, if you're looking specifically for investing stuff, mm-hmm. I started the Maryland Investors Network on Facebook like 10 years ago. I think today there's like 17,000 people in it. And I got rid of it. I gave it to a friend uh, about a month ago because I was just okay. trying to like simplify my life. So I, sure. I got rid of the Google group that I ran and a couple of Facebook groups that I ran just because I just want to be able to focus more on, you know, like enjoying the rest of my life and not getting constant notifications about people complaining about somebody's post or something. <laughs> yeah. But, no, uh, it uh, sounds so like you've been, a great place to go. You've been very intentional about focusing on quality over quantity. It seems like in a lot of facets of your life. I mean, I don't want to, yeah, no, that's true. That's true. I, mean, I mean, it was like when I was, you know, like, in that a uh, different lifestyle, I focus mm-hmm. more on like I'll just use like girlfriends as an example, more quantity than quality. Mm-hmm. Where I might have like three different girlfriends in a weekend. <laughs> and it was like, you know, as I got older, it was more like quality. Yeah. Like I and so today I'm married and I know yeah. this is about to end. This you yeah. could cut this out, but <laughs> so my high school girlfriend that I was in love with, I broke up with her but maybe a year before I get kicked out of high school, because I knew the direction I was heading. I knew I'm going to like going to jail and I'm going to be a, you know, like a bad guy. And I knew she was going to go to college and have a wonderful life. And so I broke up with her. It crushed her. I felt terrible for years and years. And so when I'm in Hagerstown, I'm in prison and I wrote her a letter. I wrote her actually when I was in Baltimore County detention center, I think I was on lockup and I was like, Hey, here's how I turned out. You know, and she wrote me back and she said she saw a picture of me on a wanted poster, like a drawing. She said it looked just like me. She figured it was me. I was like, fast forward like four years later and maybe six months from getting out of prison. And I sent her a letter just saying, hey, here's how things turned out. Doing great. And I've got my head on straight. And, you know, I mean, there's a lot of drugs and all in, in jail. And I, but I didn't, you know, mm-hmm. I didn't involve in any of that stuff. Mm-hmm. And so she wrote me back and said, Oh, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. Don't write me anymore. So I wrote her another letter. <laughs> See, you're, you don't seem like a guy who takes no for an answer. Yeah. And, and you know what? I just, here's what I thought. I thought I'm going to tell her everything I've always wanted to tell her, mm-hmm. but didn't have the balls to tell her. 
just get this off my plate. And if she doesn't respond, that's cool. But at least I was honest with her and just told her what was going on with me at the time. And all because I made up some bullshit when I broke up with her. I said, I heard you're messing with some other guy. And I knew it wasn't true, but I had to tell her something. And I wasn't mature enough to -hmm. figure it out in my head at the time. Like I just knew it wasn't going to work, but I wasn't sure exactly why. Hmm. And so I just told her all that stuff. And then a couple weeks later, I got a letter from her saying, well, you know, on second thought, we can be pen pals. And then a couple months later, she came up to see me. I got out of jail a couple months later. We were living together a month or two after that. And two years later, we got married. And she is an amazing, amazing, amazing woman. Just absolutely just such a decent person. This is a problem that my wife has, but she's not alone. She's with another 250 million people in this country that have the same problem. They see obstacles Mm -hmm. when they stop. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, can't do it. There's an obstacle. And I'm like, man, fuck that obstacle. Like, there's a way around that shit. I'm going to either go over it, under it, and then knock it over, and we go around it. Like, there's a way around that. Oh, you don't want me to write you anymore? Okay. I'm going to write you one more letter. (laughs) And, and you know, I'm going to marry you. Wow. Yes. Yeah. I'll tell you what, man, like when I, here's a great example. When I was in Hitchhike to Florida, I got kicked out of a drug rehab. I hitchhiked to Florida. If I went home, I was going to go to jail for violating my probation. So I'm like, well, if I'm going to be on the run, I'm going to go to Florida. At least it's warm there. If I'm going to be homeless, I'd rather be homeless in Florida than homeless in Baltimore in December. So I get down to Jacksonville, Florida. And I'm like, all right, I got no money. I got no job. I got nowhere to go. But the homeless people tell you where the missions are at, like where you can mm-hmm. get your free lunches and all that stuff. So you start talking mm-hmm. to the homeless. It's like in a really an amazing community. And you start finding out. And I'm thinking like, all right, well, I don't want to live like this the rest of my life. Like, I don't mm-hmm. want to be like living under a bridge and eating in homeless shelters. So I got to figure something out. Mm-hmm. And then there's a problem. If I go get a job, then I can't eat because the homeless shelters are you know serving lunch and stuff. And I'm going to be at work. And if I go to work, I can start getting paychecks in two weeks, but I can't wait two weeks to eat. Hmm. And I, what I used to do is sometimes like I'd go into grocery stores and I would walk around with a cart and I'd throw food in it. And then I'd go near where the bathrooms are at. And then I'd grab something out of the cart and take it in the bathroom and eat it. Hmm. <laughs> that's, I mean, you got to eat, man. You <laughs> sure. got to eat. Absolutely. So that's it. And um, so that's how I would eat. But I didn't, I couldn't do that like two or three meals a day. Right. And so the idea, so the thought occurred to me, it's like, well, why don't you get a job at a place that sells food, man? So I got, yeah. I got a job at a hot dog stand and I was a hot dog eating mofo, man. <laughs> <laughs> I got a job working at a hot dog stand in a mall. It was called, uh, I can't remember what it was called, but it was on the St. John's river in Jacksonville. It looked like the inner Harbor of Baltimore. It was built by the same uh-huh. company with the shops and all that stuff. So I got a job eating, making hot dogs at a hot dog stand. And then I found a crackhead mailman that was renting rooms and I started renting a room from the crackhead mailman. So there just, are ways around stuff. So when you have these obstacles, mm-hmm. there's a way around. I'm going to tell you how I used to steal cars. I don't know how to hotwire cars. I don't know how to do it. I didn't want to like carjack people. Like I didn't mm-hmm. want to turn it into that kind of drama thing because then the police are like really looking for you. If you just steal a mm-hmm. car, like they'll just find you when they find you. Mm-hmm. So what I started doing was uh, I started calling in pizza companies like, you know, carry outs. And I did this in Pennsylvania and Maryland. I would find an apartment building in the area, get the address. And this was back when they had pay phones. And I get put the quarter in and call them, say, Hey, I want to order a large pepperoni and onion pizza delivered the 4,300 La Plata Avenue apartment G. Right. Hang up. (laughs) I guess sit across the street from it. Half hour later, here comes a pizza guy pulls up, jumps out, runs in with the pizza, and they always leave their cars running. Always. <laughs> Got to get to his next delivery stop. Right? And then I'd yeah. hop in his car and take off. Wow. And sometimes there'd be another pizza in there. So I get a pizza, I get a car and a pizza. <laughs> so to be clear, you're not recommending that anybody go out and do that. No, no, no. no, no. I'm just saying that, that there's, there's, obstacles there's always a way around it. Around yep, the obstacles. Absolutely. And that's my whole point of saying this. It's just no, like, I mean, that's, around it, man. You know, yeah, like, I mean, there's always a way. You don't got no money. You want to buy an apartment building and you got no money? That's not an obstacle for me. It's like, it's like, I man, don't let those things stop me. So many lessons to take from this. I mean, so many gold nuggets and this has been really, really good, Mark. Yeah. I mean, this has been a phenomenal episode. So I, I think we need to get you out there more. <laughs> well, I really appreciate that. I really do. And it's like, I, it's, I'm very, you know, I mean, if you've watched all my other stuff, you know, I'm very sincere. Yeah. With this. I, right. I really, 
want to make a difference, a positive impact on other people's lives. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, and, it's like, I mean, and, and for me, the payback, like the way I get paid is when I have somebody that I don't even know, mm-hmm. and this happens kind of regularly, mm-hmm. like send me an email or they run to me somewhere mm-hmm. and they say, what? and I heard you speak somewhere and you really made a difference in my life. Like that's the payback. Yeah. That yeah. means more to me than if somebody pays me a couple thousand dollars. If somebody pays me a couple thousand dollars. The truth is in a month from now, I'm not even remember what to spend on. <laughs> somebody comes up to me and says, man, you made a difference in my life. A month later, I'm going to remember that. 10 years later, I'm going to remember it. Mm-hmm. And every time I remember it, it makes me feel good. So, yeah. so that stuff, I'm, I'm at a point in my life now where that makes more of a difference to me than the money. Mm-hmm. So that's why I love, I love doing these, just to make a difference. It's phenomenal. I mean, it's very easy for us to lose sight of the fact that it's all about people and relationships. You know, the relationships um, are huge, man. Yeah. Your reputation. So, is so important. And, yep. and that's another podcast, but like the networking yeah. reputation, just how yeah. I get people. I, and I've talked about this in other forums mm-hmm. where, mm-hmm. you know, six years ago, my appliance repairman calls me up and asks me if I want to go out to lunch with him. I'm like, okay. sure. I mean, who doesn't want to go out to lunch with their appliance repair guy? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> So we go out to lunch and he says, Mark, I'm selling my business in January. I'm going to have a million dollars. Do you want to borrow it? Borrow it? No, it's like, I guess he didn't do a background check. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like he didn't do a case search. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm flattered. And I just, sure. I looked at him and I said, Glenn, I'm just curious. Like, you know, you've been selling appliances to investors all over Baltimore for years. Like, and he told me I was the only one he was asking. I was like, why'd you, why'd you ask me? Mm-hmm. And he said, well, your tenants were your reference. I know, I'm thinking like, all right, my section eight tenants were my reference. This is going to get real interesting. <laughs> he said, listen, he says, when we go deliver appliances to other landlords' houses or do repairs, the tenants are always, my landlord don't fix shit. My heat ain't worked in six months. My refrigerator... Mm-hmm hasn't worked in three months. He don't do anything. He says, but my tenants always speak highly of me. Mm. My tenants That's love great. me. And he says, so if you're going to treat your tenants like that, then I think yeah. you're going to treat me like that. And, and that's another important thing is that I talk about in other things is like, it doesn't have to be an adversarial relationship. Mm-hmm. My yeah. tenants are like customers. You know, it's like, yeah. it's like if you're in a restaurant, do you see your guests as adversarial or do you see them? as I want my guests to be happy. I want them sure. to enjoy their experience. And I want them to come back and tell all their friends. So <laughs> Absolutely. I see my tenants is the same thing. And so you can be a dick and nickel and dime them to death and all that stuff. And then yeah. in two years, they leave and now you're stuck with a vacant unit. Or you can be nice to them and they stay there for 10 years. That's my philosophy. It's like, yeah. I, I'm, a, no, I'm, a, I'm selling it. a product. My product <laughs> is housing and they're, my, and they're my customers. And I want happy customers. Mark, I just want to thank you for coming on. This has been of phenomenal. Course, man. And to our listeners out there, Don't forget to go out and do some good deeds. Take care, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to the Good Deeds Note Investing Podcast. If you like what you just heard, feel free to share us with your friends and colleagues, as well as drop by iTunes and leave a rating or comment. You can visit our website at www.gooddeedsnoteinvesting.com to sign up for email updates for future shows and access all of our great content, including show transcripts, case studies, video tutorials, and more. Don't forget to join us next time for another episode on building your wealth and making a difference.